Sunday nights, we are continuing a study on the book of Revelation, and we're talking about the beast and some things about the beast, the character of the beast, how the beast rose up, how it got its power, how it got its existence. There was a promise made to Israel by God in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, that, and also in Leviticus, the 26th chapter, that if Israel, God makes this promise as they're coming out of, the, out of Egypt, and he gives them the law, and he says, if you're obedient to me, if you obey me, it's all about obedience. It's all about truth. Truth is something you do. He that doeth the truth cometh to the light. You're not in the light if you don't do truth. You say, I'm awful young. Am I supposed to do the truth as young as I am? You're supposed to do as much truth as you know, and you're supposed to be seeking it if you belong to God. But he said, if you obey me, he says, I will give you all the crops He said, your fields will be full, and he says, your womb will be full. And he said, you'll, and the key to the beast, the key to the power of the beast, key to the power of the beast. God says, as long as you're obedient, you'll go against your enemy one way, and your enemy will flee seven ways. It doesn't matter how big they are, who they are. And all through the Old Testament, God gave Israel the ability against insurmountable odds, but he usually worked some miraculous trick on people. God did a lot of tricky things. He did a lot of tricky things. Let me put this up here somewhere. God was tricky. He deceived the enemies of Israel. He deceived them. In fact, the Bible says he deceives people. Uh, He says the deceived and the deceiver is mine. He also said that he's going to send men strong delusion that they would believe a lie because they received not the love of the truth. There in 2 Thessalonians, that second chapter there. But God is tricky in the way that he would cause Israel. This is how they could be fighting against 150,000 like they were fighting against the Assyrians. And they and God would bring up some miraculous thing to make to come about, and people say, "How could seven thousand Israelites whip over a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand uh, Syrians?" Well, because God God just works miraculously with them. I don't know how He did that with them. I, I can see how He did some of the things He did. He took David, and David went out against Goliath. Even when David killed Goliath, now David wasn't some little scrawny kid like they paint in a picture. To be a shepherd boy, you had to be, David was probably just under uh, military age. You had to be 20 years old to be in the, in the Israel's army. What gets me is right after David in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, That's where he goes out and kills Goliath. Well, here's what gets me, is they come up and they say, well, David was a skinny little shepherd boy when he killed Goliath. He was just skinny and he just kind of twirled his sling around his head. No, 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 no. Those shepherd boys would practice with that sling all day long. If you ever slung with a sling, I used to make slings when I was little. If you took a jagged rock, it would go... Just go every kind of direction. But if you took a round smooth rock, it would go straight. And I'd take a long shoe string and I'd take a tongue out of his shoe and I'd, and you hold the sling in one hand and you go, and you throw it like that. And you can, if you can get really good with it, it's very destructive. In fact, you can kill a man with a sling. In fact, most of those, they had these companies of men among the Benjamites that they were so good with the sling that they frightened people because when the men with the slings went after you, it was like getting shot with a rifle. When you get hit with a stone that big, as hard as a man can sling it, it's going to kill you if it hits you in the head. Well, David knew how good he was, and some of those shepherd boys could hit, hit a hair's breadth at 30, 40 yards. And they could kill a man at that far. When David's saying, what is this lumbering giant out here? I killed a bear. 
I killed a lion. David didn't kill a lion and a bear in the 18th chapter when he goes before Saul. He didn't say, I killed a lion and a bear while I was a skinny little kid. You understand what I'm saying? When we go out against the enemy, we have to know the instruments that we're using. You have to know the instrument that you're using. And David knew his capabilities with a sling. He said, I can hit that guy right between the eyes and it will knock him out and I'll get his sword and I'll chop his head off. He knew his capabilities. That wasn't as much of a miracle with David as it was going out against 7,000, taking 7,000 and going out against 100,000 Philistines. Because David knew what he could do. Besides that, there's this lumbering giant out here. David's not going to go out there and go one-on-one and start sword fighting him like Earl Flynn. You know, Robin Hood. He's not going to do that. But God said, if you will be obedient to me, you'll go one way and they'll flee seven ways. But if you're disobedient, if you're disobedient to me, he says... You will go against your enemy one way, and you will flee seven ways. And I've been giving you some illustrations out of the Old Testament of how God brought this about in Israel. And I'm, going to, I'm showing you how that, how that Israel would go against their enemies and have, when they were obedient to God, or at least when God hadn't decided to scatter them yet. Now, God would be patient with Israel. He would go through many kings in Israel. And as he'd go through these kings, he wouldn't decide to scatter them and destroy them till hundreds of years down the line. He he started getting his fill with Jeroboam bringing golden calf in. And then Nadab and Baasha, these were very wicked people. Zimri and Amri were wicked. So was Ahab. Uh, And his sons Ahaziah and Jehoram were wicked. And Jehoahaz and Jehoash and Jeroboam the second, these were not really nice guys. Most of these were wicked people. Most of the southern Judah was, a few of them were pretty good guys. But whenever that they were disobedient to God, God said, finally, I will have you destroyed. But what I'm trying to do is show you how that God would protect Israel while they were still under his covenant strength. Now, we found that the beast, the Bible says the beast received their power. That there's a, that there's, the beast receives their power from the ten horns. Now I've already stated that the ten horns are the ten northern tribes of Israel. And somebody that hasn't heard this, they'll say, huh? What are you talking about? How could the ten northern tribes be the ten horns? Each one of the tribes was considered to be, each one of the tribes. When we say tribe, we don't mean, let me put it this way so you'll understand better. Where is my, oh, here we are. Each, the northern Israel was comprised, these were the kings. Northern Israel was comprised of ten tribes or ten families. Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. And Jacob has 10 sons. One, two, three, or 12 sons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We know the first son was Reuben and the second son was Simeon. And then you had Levi and Judah. And on down the line, uh, Dan and Issachar. And Naphtali on down to the 11th, Joseph, and the 12th, Benjamin. This was all of Israel, and each one of these tribes was an army in itself. Each one of them was an army. They could go out and take on another nation by themselves as a, as a family. All of it was one family, but each one of these sons possessed a tribe. And those 12 tribes make up the nation of Israel. That's what they make up. Well, we know that God said, if you're obedient, He says, you'll be able to conquer your enemies no matter how much you're outnumbered. And the Bible says over there in Revelation, the 17th chapter, that the ten horns give their power to the beast. The beast gets their power to conquer the world 
Only from one place. Only from one place. When they came up against Israel, if Israel had been obedient, then Israel would have conquered the beast. Israel would have conquered Babylon. Israel would have conquered Assyria. Israel would have conquered Rome, Greece, Persia. No one could have conquered Israel as long as they were obeying God. And let me tell you something. That includes the church too. If we will be obedient to him, we were talking about separating from family before we started. If we will do what he says, he will make our lives turn out better being obedient to what he says than sitting around trying to reason it out according to our reasoning. That's why Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. When it says trust in the Lord with all thine heart, it means believe him that his ways are better than your ways. Lean not to thine own understanding. Don't try to sit out and figure out and say, well, yeah, but let me figure out how I, can, how I can convince my family to do this or that. He said, my ways are better than yours. Just believe me that I know what I'm talking about. We don't really believe God sometimes. You know that as, as, as adult Christians, we don't. Because if we did, we wouldn't go against what he says, would we? But do we do that? We sit around, and especially when you're new in this message and, and your family's celebrating Christmas and, you're, and your family's uh, into free will and they don't believe in predestination and they want to fight you on everything, you say, well, you sit around and say, well, let me see. I think if I say this, I can convince them. Wait a minute. Maybe if I'm nicer to them, I know what I'll do. I'll go and say, hi, how's everybody doing? And then I'll ease this in real smooth and easy, and I can convince them. God says, don't do that. Doesn't he? But what we try to do is we think, I got it figured out better about how to reach my family than God's got it. He says, no, separate from them. If they're elect, they'll be ashamed. What? And then he looks at us and says, what's the matter? You don't believe I know more about how to get them in than you know how to get them in? See, we really believe sometimes that we know more about life than God knows about life. I don't say these things in order to upset people. I say, and I don't say a lot of these things because it's what I want to be. It's not what I want. It's what the Bible says. I'm going, well, God... Here's what I want to do. But I can't do what I want. I'm going to do what you say do. That's what we need to learn. But that's what Israel didn't learn. They had a hard time learning it. If we are obedient to the word of God and do what he says, we will conquer our enemies because we are spiritual Israel, aren't we? We're Jews of the heart. We're circumcised of the heart. And we will conquer our enemies. And it won't be on our terms Okay, God, I want you to kill that guy. Give him a heart attack. Now, sometimes when you start conquering your enemies, a lot of my old enemies from 30 years ago, most of them are dead or dying. And somebody says, do you hear this? So-and-so died. I said, he did. I used, to, I used to be interested in him dying, but I ain't interested in him more. You understand what I'm saying? I used to want him to die. I wish to pray God would kill him for being the liar and the thief that he was. And now I don't care. See, when God gets ready to take revenge and causes you to conquer your enemies, it won't be in your time. And we, that's what we think. Well, God, if, it's, if you're going to make it happen, make it happen today. Well, he said, you don't work the way I work. All right, now, we're talking about the power that the beast has to exist and overrun the nations was given to them by the ten northern tribes when Ahab and Jezebel brought grove and, and Baal worship into northern Israel. That's, and that was the ten tribes. And Micah says, what is the transgression of all of Israel? Was it not northern Israel or Samaria or the ten northern tribes? Are these ten horns? They got their power from the ten horns. That's where they got it. And the ten horns are not it's not the European economic community. Has any of y'all heard that garbage? That's stupid. First of all, because the Bible says 
when John wrote the book of Revelation that God hath put in the hearts. Hath put, that's past tense, aorist indicative, he hath put in the hearts of the ten horns somewhere in the past to give their kingdom to the beast. And they don't have a kingdom as of yet, but it looks like Israel's going to have one here before long, doesn't it? And I'm talking about spiritual Israel. I don't know how it's all going to wind up, but I believe that if we, obedient to God, will conquer our enemies, and it won't be the way we think our enemies are supposed to be conquered, and it won't be in our time. We want God to deal our enemies the death blow today, don't we? Well, I'm sorry, that ain't the way it works. If we will trust in God, believe Him, he will cause you to conquer all your enemies in your life. Be obedient. Use this book. You know how we need to do? We need to use this book just like, okay, you're going to put that, uh, put that washer together. Okay, what, where does this little screw go here? Okay, let me see here. I got the instruction book. It says that it goes right there. Well, I think it feels better. Look, don't care. Put it right there where it says it goes. Well, I'm sincere about it. Look, it doesn't matter. Put it where it belongs. But we get that way about the Bible, don't we? Well, I just don't think God really meant it that way. I think I can put it over here. I won't have to get up under there and squeeze my arm under there. And Well, do that. That's where it belongs. Don't we do that? But I think if I, I think, I think, who cares what you think? If we will follow God's instructions, we will overcome our enemies, our problems. We can sit back and rest if we'll come to the place of realizing that God's got everything already ordained before the world began and believe that and act that way. Then we'll realize that He'll... But we get so emotionally involved in our own families, don't we? We got to stop that. Because everybody's not elect. Everybody's not elect. Now, I'm giving you some illustrations of how that Israel actually overcame their enemies. I want us to go over here to, to 2 Kings, the 6th chapter. 2 Kings, the 6th chapter. Now, at this time, we, have, we studied up through... The fifth chapter of Second Kings. Studied up to the fifth chapter. Now God does miraculous things for his people to overcome their enemies. He does things and I don't know exactly. I'm not being a... I don't believe in Pentecostalism and I don't believe in the charismatic doctrine. But God will work things miraculously in our lives to overcome our enemies when we're obedient to Him. Now, we were studying in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter about Naaman, the prophet of uh, the, uh, the uh, commanding general of Syria. Now, it seems as though Israel and Syria have been battling since the beginning of time. Syria is directly above Israel. Here's Israel. Here's Syria up here. Here is Lebanon. This is Jordan right here. Jordan is the old land of Moab and Ammon. Moab and Ammon were the two sons. Moab and Ammon were the two sons of Lot by his daughters. You remember when they left when you look at, there's the Dead Sea. Here's the Dead Sea. Let me put this on the board. Here's the Dead Sea. And this is the Jordan River that goes up to the Sea of Galilee up here in the north. And then you come down here and you're at the bottom of Israel here. And there's the Mediterranean Sea. And here's the Dead Sea. Right below the Dead Sea is Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Sodom and Gomorrah, right below the Dead Sea. When Lot and his wife left, left Sodom, they went over here into the land of Moab, and somehow Lot had an incestuous relationship with his two daughters. He did not have an incestuous relationship for sexual reasons. That's not why they did that. His two daughters, everyone that was associated with Israel, knew the promises of God about Israel bringing forth the Messiah so they all believed that they could not, their seed could not perish. So his two daughters took him up into a cave and seduced him and they both became pregnant by Lot. This is Abraham's nephew. They both became pregnant and and northern uh, northern Jordan, this is the land of Jordan, right next door to Israel. Here's Israel. Northern Jordan. Here's Jordan right here. I can't draw this very well. This is Jordan. Southern Jordan is the land of Moab. Moab was one of the sons of Lot by the incestuous daughter. Northern Israel is the land of Ammon. Or the, the oldest son's name was Ben-Ami. And we get the word the land of Ammon from Ben-Ami. And Ammon, Jordan is the capital of Jordan. That's where these come from. Jordan is first cousins to the Israelites. So this is, uh, what was I going to give you here? I was bringing you to a point. Huh? The two sons. Okay. <laughs> anyway, this, I was bringing you to a point. I don't even know where it was. I'll probably think of it in a minute. Anyway, we're talking about, we're talking about Israel overcoming their enemies. Now, oh, well, I was talking to you about Jordan, what Jordan was in Syria. Remember, the, in the land of Ammon, when David was, when David saw Bathsheba up on a mount, up on a, up on the top of her house, and he was up in the palace, and she was naked, and he said, "I want that woman." Her husband was fighting the Ammonites, and if you'll notice. If you'll notice, the Ammonites and the Syrians up here, Syria, the Ammonites, and this is what we call the Gaza Strip, Gaza Strip, that is the land of the Philistines. You get the word Palestinian from Philistine, you get the word Palestinian, well, Here's Israel, here's southern Judah, southern Judah, here's northern Israel, and Israel is sandwiched in between the land of Ammon, the land of the Philistines, and Syria's up here, and guess who's always attacking them, and here's Moab over here. They're always being attacked by Moab, they're always being attacked by the Ammonites, and they're being attacked by Syria. And they're being attacked often by the Philistines. And they're always sandwiched in there. And they're constantly under, in some kind of a battle or some kind of a confrontation with their enemies. And oh yes, by the way, it was the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Syrians, and also the people up here in Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon. These are the same people, not only that were attacking them, but these are the same people that were polluting them with their sun and tree gods. And these are the people that God's bringing judgment on. So what we're talking about is all these people that are surrounding Israel, and God had a lot to deliver them from because they had many, many enemies. Now, we're here in the sixth chapter... Elisha is the prophet. Elisha. God always has a prophet. The prophet was the mouth of God upon the earth. The mouth of God. Now we're coming out of the fifth chapter of 2 Kings. 
And the man who was the, the, man who was the uh, commanding general of Syria at this time, uh, his name was Naaman. Naaman is in the fifth chapter, and he was the commander of Ben-Hadad's, Ben, H-A-D-A-D, I pronounce it that word way, it's probably pronounced Ben-Hadad, but I call it Ben-Hadad so you can remember it. I do things phonetically so you can remember it. I'm not going to try to get real proper in the pronunciation because I want you to remember these names. And I do that a lot in Greek as well. Try to make something phonetically sounded so you can remember it. I don't care whether you pronounce the word right or not. I want you to remember what it does it mean. Now, we're talking about Israel conquering these enemies. Well, Naaman has been, he's been washed seven times in the Jordan River. He was commanded, he was commanded by Elisha, to wash in the river, and he resented that very much. But when he was was cleansed of his leprosy, which that is a picture of our blood baptism that cleanses us of sin, that's one of the many instances of the Old Testament in the 5th chapter of 1st and 2nd Kings, that's a picture of us being cleansed of sin. Now, we're going into this 6th chapter. Elisha is the is the prophet of God. Always God has a major prophet. He's got a major prophet that rises up in Israel above all the other prophets. Elisha just took the place just a few chapters earlier in the second chapter of 2 Kings. In the second chapter of 2 Kings, Elijah was carried away in a great whirlwind. And Elisha said, that was Elijah. Don't confuse the two. Elisha is the one who's the prophet. Now, Elisha prophesies in Israel for approximately 50 years. He does more miracles than Elijah ever did. And one of the miracles here in the 6th chapter, and I don't mind telling you, I've wrestled with this miracle. I looked at everybody's opinion on it, and I believe above anything else, Elisha's, at times, his authority was in question because he had these Big, huge shoes to fill. He had the shoes of Elijah to fill. But what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to show you how Israel had strength as long as they were believing God, as long as they had some believing men. Now, at this time, at this time, we're simply the Elisha. Let me get slow down here. Elisha was actually prophesying in northern Israel. The prophet of northern Israel at this time, remember, during the reign of Ahab, that wicked king and his wife Jezebel, each one of these kings had a prophet that would come to them and tell them when they were doing wrong. Remember, Rehoboam had a prophet. His name was uh, Shemai. Remember that? He told him, don't go up here and attack northern Israel. And each one of these kings had a prophet. Elijah was the prophet in northern Israel, and he was the guy that called Ahab to account. Elisha, it is Elisha that takes his place in northern Israel. So we're dealing with the kings of northern Israel at this time. And the man who is king in northern Israel at this time, Ahab has died in the last chapter of 1 Kings. You remember the man draws the bullet of venture, kills, Eli- kills Ahab. Well, let me just set this up. Back up, back up to 1 Kings. Back up to 1 Kings. You got to keep these guys straight. Back up to 1 Kings. In verse 34, Ahab is trying to hide himself as he goes into battle, 22. Ahab, has, he has recruited the king of southern Judah, Jehoshaphat. Now, 
now let me slow down here, because if I don't, y'all get lost. Ahab has recruited Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is basically a good king. He's a godly man, a good king. Ahab is wicked to the core. Here's the best illustration. The best illustration of why you don't run around with people who don't believe God. One of the best illustrations in the Bible is these two kings. Jehoshaphat is a good man of God. He actually has the law read all over Israel. He's just a wonderful, godly man. His father was Asa. Asa was really a good man. He got old and he got kind of ornery. And God had to kill him, but he will see him in heaven. Jehoshaphat will certainly see in heaven. But Jehoshaphat started running around with Ahab. Do you know that the, do you know that the reason for all of southern Judah becoming corrupt with Baal and the grove worship was because a righteous man ran around with the wrong man. A righteous man of God made friends with an evil, wicked man. And the Bible says that if men do not bring any of the, do not bring the doctrine of God, we're not to bid them God's speed. We don't bring them into our house. We don't have any fellowship with them. Because evil communications, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 33, he said, evil communications corrupt good morals. They'll corrupt you. And Ahab corrupted Jehoshaphat. He corrupted him. Now, in fact, when you look at Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat's son was Jehoram. Ahab had two sons, Ahaziah and Jehoram. Jehoshaphat's sons, son Jehoram had a son and called his name Ahaziah. What are these two guys doing? They've, one's got a son named Ahaziah and one Jehoram. One's got a son named Jehoram and a grandson named Ahaziah. Why is that? Evil associations. You run around with the wrong people and you'll end up naming your kids after. You say, I won't have a kid. I think I'll name him after. I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. You've already got a son named Jehoram. I think I'll name my son Jehoram too since I like you so much. That's exactly what happened there. You know that these two men's sons and grandsons show their closeness? That's when you get real close to somebody Said so my buddy had a son, and he named him so and so. I think I'll name him after his son. And you start naming after each other. That shows you the closeness of them. Here's a righteous man. Here's an unrighteous man. And Jehoshaphat, regardless of all of his righteousness, when he was running around with Ahab, he caused his son Jehoram. He got around Ahab one too many times, and Jehoram saw. Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, that was Athaliah. And he ended up married to her. And she's a wicked woman. She killed all of, she killed all of Jehoram's and her grandchildren trying to get the throne of Israel for herself. Now that's what's wrong with running around with the wrong people. Truth to a lie. Huh? You marry truth to a lie. That's the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Now, Let's just set this up. Well, Ahab goes into battle. Jehoshaphat recruits Ahab. I mean, Ahab recruits Jehoshaphat. He goes down and says, we're brothers. We're, we're of the same nation. Uh, won't you go to battle with me while I go up here and fight Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria? Would you go with me? I'll go with you. My horses will be your horses. Yes, I, I, I want to be your buddy and your pal. I, I want to hug you and embrace you into my family. I did that with some... When I was in gospel music and pop music, I embraced people into my life and my world, and they nearly destroyed me. It's not like I haven't had experience in this. I have. 
If you run around with the wrong people, they'll bury you. Won't they? Has anybody done that besides me? Yes, sir. Boy, haven't we ever. They'll destroy your life. And that's what Ahab did to Jehoshaphat. He destroyed this lineage of God down in southern Judah. And they brought this, they brought this Baal and Grove worship down into southern Judah. It was northern Israel, the ten tribes. This was the transgression of all of Israel. Well, Ahab gets Jehoshaphat to go into battle with him. Of course, he disguises himself. And here, and he thinks he disguises himself by putting on Jehoshaphat's clothes, and Jehoshaphat puts on his clothes. And God says, you can't get away from me in battle. You can't get away from my judgment. And he has a certain man draw a boy to venture in verse 34. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel, or Ahab, between the, har- between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I'm wounded. And he died that day, and the dogs licked his blood because it was a judgment of God. Now look over here in... He was thinking they'd kill Jehoshaphat, but when they caught up with Jehoshaphat, they said, you're not Ahab, we're not interested in killing you. Where is he? They took off and left him alone. He, they thought, but once they found him, they said, we're not interested in anybody but Ahab. We want to kill him. We want him dead. <laughs> yeah, well... Let me tell you, I have run around the wrong people, and I've had them put me in a hitch. I can't go into all of the stories. I've had them put me in a, between a rock and a hard place, and they didn't care, and they walked away, left me hanging. I mean, legally, criminally, every kind of a situation you can think of, I've been in where the guy will leave you in a crack when he's worthless. We got no business hanging around that. And neither did Ahab have any, neither did Jehoshaphat have any business hanging around Ahab. Then, look over here in, in verse 49. Then said Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, unto Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with thy servants in the ships, but Jehoshaphat would not. And Jehoshaphat, we're in verse 50, slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father, and Jehoram his son Reign in his stead. Jehoram takes the throne. Now, where we are, where we are over here in the fifth chapter, in the fifth chapter, we're talking about Jehoram, the son of Ahab. So Jehoram, you have to keep these Jehorams straight. And Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Jehoram, his son, reigned in his stead. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father, in the way of his mother, in the way of Je- Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked, the, and provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done. Talking about the son of Ahab. Now Ahaziah is king in Ahab's place. He's king in Ahab's place. Jehoram is king in his father Jehoshaphat's place. But Ahaziah dies in this first chapter of 2 Kings. He falls through some... Oh, let's read a little bit of it. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Let me explain something to you. After the two nations are split, any time the Bible refers to Israel, we know that northern Israel 
is Israel. Southern Judah is Israel. But after the two nations split, any time the name Israel is used, it's a reference to northern Israel because Judah will be called southern Judah. And remember, Judah is comprised of the tribes. The, tri the kingdom of southern Judah is comprised of two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Remember this, that Judah was one of the tribes and it was also the name for the southern kingdom. Don't confuse the tribe of Judah. It, of course, southern, the southern kingdom was named after Judah because the king will come out of Judah. Remember that? Jesus comes out of Judah. David comes out of Judah. And that's where the king comes from. So you have to remember that. You got to keep these Ahaziahs and Jehorams straight. Now, this Ahaziah, this Ahaziah dies in the first chapter. The first chapter of 2 Kings is where, well, let's read a little bit of it. Moab rebels against Israel. That's northern Israel. After the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah, speaking of the Ahaziah of northern Israel, fell down through a lattice in his supper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Great day in the morning. This is the Ahaziah of northern Israel. This is not the Ahaziah of southern Judah because he's not king yet. His brother Jehoram is still king. Remember? You got to keep that straight. So this is talking about the Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, northern Israel. Because Jehoram is the king of southern Judah, right? So it has to be the Ahaziah of northern Israel. And he said, go and require... Ekron was one of the capital cities, was one of the capital cities of the Philistines. What? Northern Israel is going to go, is the king of northern Israel, Ahaziah, is going to seek counsel at some pagan god? Well, his, well when he sends, he sends men out to go to this place and see if they can't require of Beelzebub, if he's going to live or die, they run across Elijah. Elijah's still the prophet. And Elijah said, is it because there's not a God in Israel that you go and require of a pagan God? Now remember, Elijah is the prophet to northern Israel. So when you're talking about a particular prophet, he's the prophet to Ahab. He's not going down here and prophesying in southern Judah. He is a prophet to Ahab. And he's going to be a prophet to Ahaziah, his son. And he's going to be a prophet to Jehoram, his other son. Well, he, Ahaziah sends, the story is, and I've gone through it. He sends, uh, when, Ahab, when Elijah says this, they go back and tell Ahaziah. They say, hey, Ahaziah, we ran across this prophet. And he says that, there's a God in Israel, and what do you want us to do? He said, you go tell Elijah, I demand an audience with him right now. I'm king of Israel. You tell him to come to me. And of course, they say, well, how are we going to bring him in? Well, do what we always do. Send a captain in his 50s, and you go out there, wherever he is, and they go to some mountain where Elijah's living. They say, Elijah, are you there? We demand, our king Ahaziah demands that you come down off of that mountain and you come and you have audience with him. And all of a sudden, fire comes down from heaven and goes poof and they're all a bunch of matchsticks, these 50 guys and this captain in their 50s. And they're burnt up right there. And the messenger goes back and Elijah says, you go tell, you go tell Ahaziah, that the God of Israel is not to be trifled with and you don't order his prophet around. So Ahaziah sends out another captain of his 50s and Elijah calls fire from heaven and poof, they're dead. They're matchsticks, little eyeballs sticking out, nothing but a matchstick left, that's it. <laughs> and the third time, the third time, 
this third captain in his 50s goes out to the mountain. And his eye says, you go out there and tell him. I demand that he come down and tell me if I'm going to live. And that third captain in his 50s, you can just see him going. <laughs> he, he, let out his, he told Elijah about his favorite Italian wine. You know, his favorite Italian wine was, don't you? Please don't kill me. <laughs> That's what he did. He went up to the mountain and said, So, oh, Elijah, please don't kill us. Boy, he got humble. Elijah said, Okay, I won't kill you, but you go back and tell him he's going to die. And he did. He died, and his brother becomes king instead. Boy, I'll tell you what, God is not to be trifled with, is he? People think they can just play with God. He'll kill you. Well, now Jehoram is king. And you need to understand. Let me write on this. Elijah is the prophet. And then in the second chapter, Elisha takes his place. So when you're thinking of Elijah and Elisha, think of northern Israel. Okay? Northern Israel with Elijah and Elisha. Because that's, that's who they're preaching to. They're not preaching to southern Judah. That's the best way you can get these two Ahaziahs straight and these two Jehorams straight. Remember, in southern Judah, Jehoshaphat's son was Jehoram and his grandson was Ahaziah. In northern Israel, Ahab's two sons were Ahaziah and Jehoram. Huh? What, here in southern Judah? Well, Obadiah is one of the prophets. Uh, you got several different prophets that come to Jehoshaphat. But usually, when a man is being obedient to God, like Jehoshaphat was up to this point of running around with Ahab, everything is going along pretty good. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't have some great fiery prophet like Elijah and Elisha. Now, in the second chapter of 2 Kings, Elijah is carried away in a whirlwind. And he is told, he, and Elisha has been begging Elijah, let me have a double portion of everything that you've got. We always think of Elijah as the great prophet, but Elisha prophesied more years and performed more miracles than Elijah did. But what's so great about Elijah? When, when the Baal and the grove was brought into Israel in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings, it was Elijah that began to pronounce the downfall of Israel. That's why in the Old Testament, he pronounced the downfall. Elijah began... Elijah began to pronounce the downfall of Israel in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings. And then when you get to, get to the book of Luke, or in Matthew as well, you get over here, you find that John the Baptist is pronouncing the, the restoration of spiritual Israel, and he is the New Testament Elijah. That's what the Bible says. That he, that John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah. But Elisha, what we're doing is we're talking about Elisha who took Elijah's place when Elijah was carried away in a fiery chariot in that second chapter of 2 Kings. So when you get to the third chapter and the fourth chapter and the fifth chapter, you're talking about northern Israel because these are the events in the life of Elisha and that's talking about northern Israel. Now, Elisha is the prophet. Let's go back over here to the... It is Elisha in that second chapter where the people curse Elisha because he is a bald-headed man. And they believed baldness was a sign of a curse from God because when a man 
had leprosy. He was, and he had leprosy on his head. His head would become bald, and so they cursed him. And when they began to curse these, it says it speaks of them as little children. In verse twenty-three, and Elisha went up from thence into Bethel. This is in the second chapter. He went up from thence into Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children. Well, the word isn't little children. The word is the word na'ar. Uh, and the word means adolescence. These were young teenagers making fun of Elisha. Out of the, there were young adolescent teenagers that came out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. If you're truly a prophet, let's see you go up in a fiery chariot like Elijah did. God says, you make fun of my preacher. You're making fun of me. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. That doesn't mean to say blankety-blank. Curse means to execrate or to cut off. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Or forty-two of these young teenagers that were giving Elijah, Elisha a hard time. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel and from thence he returned to Samaria. Now Jehoram, in the next chapter, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign in Israel, in Samaria, in northern Israel. So this is the Jehoram here, isn't it? It's the one here in northern Israel. This is northern Israel on the right, southern Judah on the left. This Jehoram, his brother Ahaziah has died, and he is the son of Ahab also, and he's starting to reign in Israel. I'll come back to him later. And he goes into battle against, he's going to go into battle against the land of Moab. But let's go back over here to the 6th chapter. I want to bring out how God brings miraculous things and miraculous ways. He saves Israel. Now let's read here in the 6th chapter. In the, and the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Evidently, it's too crowded in some respect. I don't know if there's not enough room there. The word straight means it's crowded or it's hard for them to live there. So evidently, they needed a place to expand and needed a larger place. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan and take thence every man a beam and let us make us a place there where we may dwell and he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. Now remember, Elisha is the prophet here in northern Israel. In the previous chapter, it was Naaman. Northern Israel is just south of Syria. Here's Syria, and there's northern Israel. They don't have far to go to get to Israel. And the king of Syria is Ben-Hadad, and his commanding general is a man named Naaman. And it was northern Israel where Naaman had heard that there was a prophet that could cure him. And he leaves Syria, goes down to northern Israel, and that's a long story. <laughs> Too long a story. But he didn't like the idea he had to go dip in the Jordan River. But after he did, he began to believe God. And I want you to remember that. <laughs> And one of these prophets, now, one of the sons of the prophets, the sons of the prophets, what that's talking about, there were prophecy schools. I don't know how to get into all this without just doing it. I can't preach, teach this Old Testament without doing some setups for you. I'll just remember that God was tricky, okay? <laughs> I raised that. <laughs> All right, now, let me erase this. And this still, ha every, every bit of this has to do with Israel giving up their power to the beast. 
All of it. Now, what did I start to tell you? Okay, the sons of the prophets. Where it says, and the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha. Remember over there? No, some of you don't. First Samuel. I won't tell you, ask you if you remember. Some of you will remember. But in 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter, the people say, give us a king. We want a man to be our king. And Samuel says that God was your king. They said, give us a king. When the chapter 9, God picks out Saul to be king over Israel. He was the tallest man in Israel. Head and shoulders above everyone else in Israel. But his height didn't help him in his humility. And we know that he was set up as king of Israel. In the 12th chapter, Samuel steps down. Samuel steps down up until this point. Up until this point, Israel was ruled by judges. Judges. Samuel was the 13th judge coming out of the book of Judges. When you get over here into... When Samuel steps down as the leader, as the voice of God for Israel, Samuel begins schools of the prophets. We could call those seminaries. The first seminaries in the Bible. What were the two schools of the prophets that were here during Jesus' day? Shemai and Hallel. Now, Shemai was considered to be conservative. And it was said by some of the, the Pharisees who followed the school of Hallel, that was said to be liberal. And the Pharisees were said to follow this. Some of them said that Jesus followed the school of Shammai. Well, Jesus followed his own school. If Shammai taught the truth, they taught the words of Christ. But these were the two schools of the prophets. And we've talked about the school of Ileel concerning the Halakha and the Haggadah. Remember that? These schools of the prophets started over here when Samuel stepped down. In fact, Gosh, I don't need to say that. It'll take me to a whole big subject. When David was running from Saul, David would run to the schools of the prophets to hide from Saul. And Saul would go over there and find out that he had hidden from him in one of the schools of the prophets. And at one point, Saul comes in there and Saul is so angry that, that Ahimelech had hidden David and given him sustenance and fed him, that Saul commanded, said, I want all of these 85 priests dead. And Saul, was, his jealousy was turning into a rage over, he said David was stealing his thunder and stealing his glory, and, and he was going to try to be king of Israel. He wasn't going to try to be king, he was. And Saul was so jealous that he, that he came up and said he wanted to kill these these Levites. And the men following him said, we're not killing nobody. No, sir. And there was a man stepped forward. Said, I'll kill him. You remember who he was? Doeg. Doeg was an Edomite. And Doeg said, I'll kill him. He stepped forward and killed 85 of the priests of God. Now, I'm, I'm going to go back through this at a later time. But David was... He had gone to one of the schools of the prophets to, to hide himself because he knew he could receive. He knew that the Levites knew the law and that the sons of Aaron knew the law. He knew that. And he knew that they would hide him and give him sanctuary. Now, let me get back to this. So when it says, and the sons of the prophets, it doesn't mean that their literal fathers were prophets. It means these were guys that went to the schools of the prophets and they were being, they were studying under Elisha at the school of the prophets because it was Samuel who had started all of this. 
Behold now, the place where we dwell is too straight for us. Well, I read that. And one said, Be content, I pray thee. Go with thy servant. And he answered, I will go. So he went with him. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. I have read every... Every commentary I have on this, and I haven't come up with a satisfactory answer what this was for yet. I've read Mr. Pink. I don't believe he understands it. I have read Mr. Uh, I've read uh, Edersheim on Practical Truths of Elijah. Of Elisha. Are you for I'm looking for the true meaning of it. I believe that what Elisha is doing, evidently these are very weak prophets. They're very weak young men that are not strong in the faith because if you go back to the second chapter, these are some of the same young men that he's talking to and there were several schools, but they were young guys. And remember in the second chapter when Elisha's, Elijah's carried away in a fiery chariot, and some of them come running to Elisha and they say, maybe he was carried over a mountain over there. Maybe he said, Elisha, Elisha said, no, he's going to be with God. Well, maybe he's over there. If you'll just let us go, we might go over and find him on the other side of the mountain. These were kids that were weak in the faith. This is what I believe it's more about than anything else. I believe this miracle here is more like Jesus walking on the water or it's like Jesus turning the water into wine. I believe it's for the benefit of these weak young men to show them who Elisha was more than anything else. Uh, Mr. Pink will say, oh, the, when the iron, when the axe head fell and it went in, this is like a soul that's lost and God's having to retrieve it. And I thought, boy, you're having to... Some things I don't agree with Arthur Pink on at all. I thought, he's sure twisting some square pegs to get them in round holes there. But let's read this right here. I believe what this is for is these are weak young men. And when you look at that second chapter, they're very weak. In fact, in that second chapter, they kept saying, uh, well, if you'll just let us go, we can go fight him somewhere. And finally, after a while, after, after they went for several days and they came back and said, we can't find him. He said, I told you he's going to be with God. If, all the world looked up to Elijah. Now, up to this point, Elijah has done just a couple of three miracles up to this point. I believe these young men need some proof that this man that is leading them and telling them is truly of God. And he's, he's about to show them. Now, evidently these axes weren't made that well. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Now, this evidently was something common to happen. Because look at Deuteronomy 19. Look at Deuteronomy 19. They evidently didn't have the, the way to construct axes the way we do. Because... This, this law would not be here in the 19th chapter of Deuteronomy. Look in here in verse 4. And this is the case of the slayer which shall flee thither that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not in time past, as when a man goeth into the woods with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the helve, and lieth upon his neighbor that he die, he shall flee into one of these cities of refuge and live until he can be tried in a court of law. So evidently this was a common thing to happen. God was just gracious that he did not allow one of the guys to be killed. Now, I believe what he's showing here, he's trying to show these young, weak preachers who think they know something and don't know much of anything. 
because they kept telling him, well, if we go hunt for Elijah, we can find him. And the man of God said, where did it fall? Where fell it? Where did this iron fall? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron began to float. I think that was, if that doesn't show who Elisha is to these young men, can you imagine what they said? Hey, look here, look, you know what he did? He walked on water. He made the iron to float. It swam. And the iron did swim. I believe more than anything else, these were very weak young preachers. And God said, I'll show you who my man is and what he can do. I'll tell you what, it's a very dangerous thing. There's been so many people that's come through here that have given me a hard time. If I am God's preacher, and I believe I am, you better be careful what you do to me because I won't do nothing to you. But God will. You people that have come here and tried to tear the ministry apart and hurt it, I'm warning you what God will do to you. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And Mr. Pink said, well, and he, that's a picture of the cross. No, it's not. I'm, that's really bad theology. When you start forcing square pegs, and I like Arthur Pink on a lot of things, but not on a lot of other things. He cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. And if you'll notice, this little miracle is sandwiched in between the miracle of Naaman's being cured and the following miracle which shows the power of God as Israel is going out against their enemies. And the rest of this is showing what's going to happen to you if you mess with the preacher of God. Now, I believe I am God's preacher if there ever was one. I have committed, God has committed me to him. I told Mary in a restaurant one day, and I am not saying this in some mystic way. I said, I don't know why I've seen all these things, but I believe God reached down one day and just stuck me in the top of the head and said, you, I've made you study through years and I've made you understand these things. Now you go do this. You can think what you want to think. I believe I am God's called man. Watch out what you do, God's called man, because God will get you. I believe that. I don't have to go after my enemies anymore. I'm going to be obedient to God, and God will conquer you for his sake, not for mine. Now, the rest of this shows this about Elisha. You can't fool with God's preacher. And you can't fool with the prophet in Israel. Let's continue to read. And I believe this, the iron swimming, is proof of who Elisha is. Then the king of Israel, warred, the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, he's still alive and well. He was over there warring in the... Remember him? Remember Ben-Hadad? He was over there warring. They were fighting against him in that last chapter of First Kings, weren't they? That was, old, uh, that was Ahab and, and Jehoshaphat fighting him. Wait a minute. He was over there in the 20th chapter of First Kings when he demanded the unconditional surrender of Ahab and all of Israel, wasn't he? And they went out against him and, and, and camped against him like two little flocks of kids. Remember that? This guy's been around. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, he did. And Jehoshaphat let him go. Whew. What what is wrong with a man that does I mean, excuse me, Ahab let him go. Why? He's crazy. Yeah, it was his brother. Yeah. Now, then the king of Syria, or Ben Hadad, warred against Israel. And took counsel with his servants. We're still talking about God causing Israel to conquer their enemies and giving up their power to the beast. But as of this point, 
northern Israel, they're, God's getting pretty fed up with them, but he has, at this point, he's not through with them. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. This king of Syria wars against Israel, and he takes counsel with his servants and says, Here's where my camp will be. And the man of God, who's that? Elisha. Elisha. That's Elisha. The man of God sent unto king of Israel, saying, now, beware that thou pass not such a place, for th thither the Syrians are come down. Who told Elisha? See, in verse 8, the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, says, I'm going to be right here. I'm going to encamp right here. And here's Elisha over here, and he sends the message down to the king of northern Israel. He says, Jehoram, don't you go near that place. That's where the king of Syria is. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once but twice. Elisha saved the life of Jehoram. Because if he goes up here where where Ben-Hadad's troops are encamped. If he goes up there, he's going to get killed, and Elisha warns him twice, stay away from there. How does Elisha know? Huh? <laughs> yeah. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, saved him twice, Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. How in the world can anybody know this? I haven't told anybody. I haven't told them where I'm going to set this ambush for Jehoram, king of northern Israel. <laughs> and he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Which one of our Syrians is for the king of Israel? Huh? They think he thinks there's a spy in the camp. That's what he thinks. We got a spy here. And one of his servants said, None, my lord. You don't have a spy here. I wonder who that could have been. Probably it was it was probably Naaman said no, said I have experienced a man in in Israel, he is miraculous. None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, that is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber that nobody knows. But Elisha knows he's got a God behind him. Don't mess with his God. I'm telling you, Ben Adad, I've experienced his God. You don't mess with God's preacher. You mess with God's preacher, you're in for the fight of your life with God. That's right. That's what I believe it is. I believe it's Naaman. I believe that's Naaman saying, they no spies here. God tells Elisha everything. No, Naaman wasn't that. Which? No, no, that was at the first part of this book. That's uh, those were Those were some... They were certainly some men in Israel, but no one knew the experience of God like Naaman the previous chapter. I believe it was Naaman that was telling him that. And he said, go and spy where he is. Find out where Elijah, e Elisha is. And I'm showing you how God protects his preacher and his people. And how that when God's got a righteous preacher there or a righteous king... 
And God is not through with Israel yet, but he will destroy northern Israel before it's over with. Go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, Elisha's in Dothan. It's a little town just in northern Israel. Just a little town. He's in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither. Ben-Hadad is going to send an army to surround one little town. Man. Besides that, he's bald headed. Could have been bow legged. Just looked about as dangerous as a flea out here. But he was extremely dangerous. He had the living God on his side. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and great hosts, and they came by night and compassed the city about, all for the sake of one prophet, Elisha. We'll kill him. And God won't be able to give his secrets to him anymore. Yeah. And when the servant of the man of God. Remember who that was? No, the servant of the man of God. The man of God was Elisha. Who was his servant? Gehazi. Yeah, Gehazi, yeah. That was the servant of the man of God. You remember the one who ran after, he ran after, ben ha- uh, after Naaman when Naaman wanted to give Elisha some, some goods and some money and some clothing. And Gehazi ran after. He said, he won't take the money, but I'll take it. And God struck Gehazi with leprosy. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, when Gehazi had risen early and gone forth. Now, Gehazi didn't have a whole lot of faith in God. Did he? No. Behold, and hosts compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, and all of these Syrians are all around the city. And his servants said unto him, Alas, my master, what are we going to do? The Syrians are surrounding us. All we've got is me and you and God. (laughs) You can't whip Elisha. I mean, forget that. That ain't going to happen. And he answered, fear not. For they that be with us (laughs) are more than they that be with them. (laughs) Isn't that fantastic? That is such a great statement. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. Let me tell you, they that be with you and I are more than they that be with the world. And we don't have to worry about that. We need to quit this. We need to really believe predestination that God has ordained everything the way it's supposed to be and that God knows better about what you need in your family and your friends and knows that you need to cut off fellowship with these people and you need to quit doing your Christ mass and your free will and you need to get involved in the truth and do what he says. Everybody that's ever left here that's trying to straighten their life out, they can't straighten it out because they say, this is just too hard. I think there's an easier way, Jim Brown, than doing it the way you're talking. I'm not, that is not the guy that made this up. God said it. How much time do I have, Mike? Okay. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee. Remember, prayer goes with buying to the will of God, doesn't it? Prayer is buying to the will of God. And when we bow to the will of God, then we conquer our enemies, don't we? And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. Whose eyes? Gehazi's. So Gehazi can see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. God is saying, you can't mess with my people and my preacher's It was something that men couldn't see. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Smite who? All these Syrian 
army that's out there. Smite them all with blindness. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. And he's out there misleading them and lying to them. <laughs> Elisha is lying to them. No, this is not where you want to go. Follow me. I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. And he is the man whom they seek. People say, God wouldn't have his prophet lie. Oh, yes, he would. He had an evil spirit from the Lord enter into Saul. And, he had a, and, and the angel stepped forward and said, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of Ahab to get him into battle. And it came to pass when they came into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, these Syrians were in the middle of northern Israel. Now you say, does God perform this kind of a miracle? He performs things that we can't see while we're not looking. God is tricky. I said earlier, he's tricky. And he'll, he'll trick your enemies in such a way, he'll conquer them and you won't even know they're being conquered. And this is not for your benefit anyway. It's not so you can feel good about it. It's so God can have his way. It's not so we can say, aha, I got your enemy. By the time he gets your enemy, you won't even care. And if you actually saw what God would do to your enemy, you wouldn't want that to happen to your worst enemy. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? <laughs> That's really bold of Jehoram, isn't it? That's Jehoram. He didn't have nothing to do with this. Jehoram is king. He says, father, and he's calling Elisha father. Father, shall I smite them? These kings were scared to death of the prophet. They were scared because they knew Elisha could call fire from heaven at any time. And that's why the Bible says, if one thing does not come true there in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, if a man calls himself a prophet and one thing does not come to pass, thou shalt not be afraid of that prophet. He's a liar. But boy, when a man, when everything he says is right and does is right, watch out what you do to the preacher of God. That's why when Samuel goes down to southern Judah and they meet him at the, at the gate of the city and they're going, Samuel, what are you doing here? Prophets don't come to town unless it's to bring a plague or lightning bolts or something. What are you doing here? I've come down here. God has chosen a king among the sons of Bethlehem, Judah. They were petrified of the prophet. And he's saying, Father, shall I smite them? Yeah, like you did, had something to do with it. If God wanted us to keep them blind, it would keep them blind. And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and thy bow? Do you go around killing your own captives? These are captives. Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. It was the living God that set them here in the middle of northern Israel. Now God will do whatever tricks he needs to do on the minds of people and you might not even know it's going on. He'll use everything in the world to, make, to lead people in the direction that he wants them to go. But if you expect that to happen in your life, you have to obey God. When you're obedient, you'll go against your enemy one way and they'll flee seven ways. But when you're disobedient, don't expect nothing from God except the worst. If God gives us instruction concerning our fellowship, or instruction concerning being faithful in the truth, or our instruction concerning our tithe, our giving, if we'll do what he says, he'll take care of the rest of our lives, won't he? And he prepared great provision for them. If you notice, Elisha's not out to get the Syrians, is he? He's not out to get them. 
And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. Talking about the Syrian soldiers. It probably wasn't the whole army. It was enough to take one man, unless you're Elisha. And they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged northern Israel. They're always fighting them. They didn't, these men here didn't, so the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. That's talking about these men. I believe these men, once God performed something on some Syrians, they'd say, hey, I don't want to go fight the God that can make me blind and I can't see. That's just like Naaman saying, hey, no, there's no spies in the land. They've got a prophet down there that you can't deal with. He knows everything that's going on in your bedchamber. And he tells Elisha. And he goes up to besiege Samaria. To besiege doesn't mean to go in and attack. To besiege means to I thought I was going to, I've gotten back into more history tonight, but maybe this will help us see some things. And you don't attack the preacher of God. I tell you, I don't think people realize what they're in for when they attack a man who's telling the truth. I believe a lot of the lives of people that have left here, that have tried to just make a ruckus in grace and truth and give me a hard time, I believe their lives are falling apart out there. You can't just take off and say, I'll, we've had people come here and try to fight me, actually argue with me from the back row back there and hollering at me in the pulpit on Sunday morning, trying to fight me over the tithe or something else. Just foolish man. God will deal with you guys if you don't learn to behave yourself. Now, where were we? Besiege. Besiege meant, here's a city. It means to set your armies all around and cut off all supply lines that are going in to the city. It doesn't mean necessarily go in and fight them. They were besieged because they were surrounded by armies and they had cut off all their supply lines and there was such a famine and a food shortage. Well, why would God be doing this to northern Israel? They have been corrupt from day one, haven't they? And God will get his fill of them before it's over with. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until. And ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver. Thirty pieces of silver was the price of a slave. And an ass's head was filthy and they were eating an ass's head. And for the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung, for five pieces of silver, they were eating dove's dung. They were so hungry. You say, I wouldn't eat that. Have you ever been without food for a month? Six weeks? Two months? You don't know what you'll do. People, God said, I'll cause you to eat your children when you go after these idol gods. He said, I'll destroy you. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, who's the king of Israel? Jehoram, son of Ahab, isn't he? This is the king of Israel. You've got to keep these guys straight. King of Israel is Jehoram. His brother Ahaziah's died. Ahab's dead. So Jehoram is king of northern Israel. Now, this is, amazes me. This famine is happening in Samaria or northern Israel and Ben-Hadad has come down and besieged the cities and the king of Israel is Jehoram and Jehoram gets mad at Elisha and wants to blame him for this. Huh? And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall there cried a woman unto him saying help my lord O king and he said 
If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, out of the wine press? You think I got some food where there is no food? I don't have any food. I'm King Jehoram, but I don't have any food. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee, woman? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today. And tomorrow we will, tomorrow we will eat my son tomorrow. God said, I'll cause you to eat your own children in Jeremiah the 19th chapter when you go after these idol gods. So we boiled my son. This is not figurative language. They boiled him. And we did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And she's not being fair. And I want us to... We're going to share in this. Cannibalism. Kahad ba'ah. That's what God said in Jeremiah 19. Jeremiah 19, verse 9. I will cause Israel to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat every one the, friend, the flesh of his friend in the siege and in the straightness, wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. God said, I'm going to cause that to happen. It's happening right here, isn't it? And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall. And the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within, within upon his flesh. And he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. I'm going to kill Elisha. Wait a minute. I thought you was calling him father over in verse 21. <laughs> father, shall I, shall I kill these Syrians? This guy can't make up his mind who he loves. He's the most wishy-washy, pansy, sissy king, gutless. Calling him father. And if I went back over to the third chapter, goodness gracious. He was going out against the king of Moab. And he said, and he took two other kings with him. He said, what are we going to do? The Moabites are too great. And has God brought us out here so we can be slaughtered by the Moabites? Is there not a prophet here? And one of the guys said, where's the guy marching in line here with us? We're to... Well, who is he? Well, he's Elisha. Elisha, come over here and help me. He wants Elisha when he's convenient. And when, he, and when something bad starts happening because of his sin, he wants to blame the preacher. Is he nuts? This is the same guy. Then he said, God do so more unto me if, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. In my Bible, he's saying it right here. And you can just look over there at verse 21, just right next to it. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? That's the same king saying, I'll kill Elisha over here. And over here he's saying, my father, shall I smite them? Make up your mind, you jerk. <laughs> what a fool. Jehoram, he is an idiot. I mean, you know, you're thinking, gosh, he's about as worthless as you can get, isn't he? Well, I mean, goodness, if you got, if you got a sister named Athaliah, and a mother named Jezebel and a father named Ahab, you're supposed to have uh, family problems. It'd be, dysfunctional family is to, is to say the least. This guy's an idiot, isn't he? And Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him, and the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders... See how this son of a murderer has sent to take away mine head? What's he talking about? The son of a murderer. Ahab is a murderer, a killer. Who did he murder? With Naboth. He, he murdered Naboth. 
He said, this son of a murderer is wanting to take my baby my head and the other day he was calling me father. <laughs> well, you think Jehoram's crazy. How crazy is the world? Uh, the world is nuts, aren't they? The world's crazy. He said, but ere the messenger came to him, he sent to the elders, see how this son of a murderer hath sent to take away mine head. He loves Elisha one minute and hates him the next. Look when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What evil was it? Israel eating their, eating their children. It's from God because of your sin and because your father was a murderer. And Jezebel, your mother, was a heathen and she brought all this sun and tree worship in Israel. But don't attack the preacher because if you do, you're in trouble. And I don't have to do nothing to you. God is my helper. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? And then Elisha has another miracle deliverance from the enemies in the next chapter. I'll come back next week and go into that. I've run out of time, hadn't I? But if you'll notice, as long as God's approval is on Israel, as long as his approval is on Israel, and he doesn't destroy Israel all of a sudden because of the sins of Jehoram and Ahaziah, and Ahab, God is long-suffering. He gets his fill of them. And when he's got his fill, at about the time of Hoshea, he destroys them, carries them away into captivity. Well, I, if, if you notice, I want you to notice that the reason God's delivering Israel is because of righteous Elisha. Righteous Elijah. And when God ceases to have righteous men in Israel and he has just complete unrighteousness, he starts destroying them. And carrying them. Even when he's got a righteous man there like Jeremiah, he says, Jeremiah, I've got a work for you to do. You walk through the streets of Judah and you tell them, judgment is coming and his name is Nebuchadnezzar. You could have whipped Babylon. You could have destroyed any, any enemy that came up before you. And God shows them that over and over and over and over again through all the Old Testament. And you say, how could they be so stupid? I don't know, how can America be so stupid? I believe America is going down the tubes. And I believe it's... And a lot of people say, well, I'll just be glad to see that happen. Well, I will too, but it's not going to be fun when it happens. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for allowing us to see how you'll preserve us and save us, Lord, when we're obedient to you. Lord, it may not the way, be the way we want to be preserved or saved. It'll be your way and your time. Help us to understand that because we've got so many people here that are struggling with their families Teach us to take a stand and say, here's what God said. And let us take a stand with our families in that fashion. Lord, even in the small number of people we got tonight, we got nearly everybody here is having family problems. We pray you'll give them strength. Give the believers the strength to deal with their families. and give them the boldness to stand up and say and do what they need to do according to your instructions. And Lord, cause us to crucify our own desires and our own thoughts and our own opinions. Because that's when you deliver us, Lord. And we give you praise for all these things. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to start, I've gotten a new name for Jehoram, king of northern Israel. I'm going to start calling him Flaky. Flaky.
Yeah, Flaky, King Flaky. Well, what, they, what they locked his two daughters, was that another Sarah Hagar thing where they thought they would take over and continue the line? Well, they, they did not want their bloodline to die. They, none, of the, none of the people who came out of Israel wanted their bloodlines to die, and they didn't know exactly where the Messiah would come from. We knew it would come from Judah. They didn't understand a lot of the things that we understand. And they wanted, all of them wanted their bloodlines to continue. It wasn't for sexual reasons they seduced their father. It was the same reason that Tamar seduced Judah. You remember that? In the 38th chapter of Genesis, Tamar seduced Judah because she knew that line had to continue. Well, well, that's not the remnant. The remnant would be part of all of Israel. It wouldn't be just Judah. But it's, uh, when I get in the Old Testament, it gets real complex. But you've got, you've got to keep these guys separated, though. Well, you've got, to, you've got to watch these guys as you go, and you've got to get the right Hezekiah and the right Jehoram. You've got to know why they're doing what they're doing. It is. It? <laughs> not, not the dragon. <laughs> it is amazing, isn't it? Hey, guy, how you doing? <laughs> 